Okay, my first video in my Vintorium series. Today we will be going over heated print beds for 3D printers. And specifically, we will be discussing how to insulate the bottom side of the heated print bed in order to achieve the maximum energy efficiency that we can utilize in order to keep our prints sticking to the print bed. Beside the fact that we are going to go over uh, how to make it, we are also going to go over the math and science behind why we're going to make it the way that we are. What is heat transfer? Well, heat transfer is the second derivative of this heat or power that we're talking about. And you don't need to know the second derivative or how to derive it. Just be familiar that it is derived from the heat itself. And this symbol is what we use for heat transfer. It is Q double prime. And next we will look at area because we are going to be dealing with our heat bed area which will be L by D. This L is actually the shortest dimension on that cross-sectional area and that's critical because we will use L later however we won't use D unless we're calculating the area. So L in this case is 266.7 millimeters. You see here we get a area of 0 0.079 meters squared. And it's critical that we have it in meters because we are going to be doing all of this example in metric. Now that we have our area, and that I've mentioned that L is the shortest dimension of your area, we are going to move to the actual equation of heat transfer. Heat transfer, it can be displayed in two different parts. There's a third part which is going to be deal with radiation. However, we're considering that to be negligible. We are not going to consider radiation in this problem. We're only concerned with the convection with quiescent air on a hot plate. And the quiescent air that we're concerned with is the air beneath it, which is cooling down the side and decreasing the efficiency for our top side of our plate. And we have conductivity, which we will get to on the second example when we actually include insulation with a thickness of a certain material. So K is going to be a material property of whatever that you decide to be an insulator, and T, lowercase t, is going to be the thickness of that material that you decide. Delta T is your change in temperature, and H bar is your average convective coefficient for whatever fluid that you're dealing with. In our case, it would be air. So, for our ambient fluid, our, for air at 77 degrees Fahrenheit, my apartment's temperature, it is equal to 25 Celsius, or 219.15 K Kelvin. And this is how you get from Fahrenheit to Celsius, and then Celsius to Kelvin. Now, the temperature of the bed, or the heat bed that we're going to be setting it to, is going to be 55 Celsius, which is equal to 328.15 Kelvin. I choose 55 because that's actually the temperature in my settings that I found to be the best so far. I could actually probably go a little bit lower. But this is for PLA PHA that I use the setting for. I have not tried ABS because I'm afraid how hot this temperature will end up becoming after a long period of time for, let's say, a five hour print because all the temperature is actually going to increase. In this problem, we are assuming that this is a constant. So that is one of the flaws that we will not be combating with this example. So for the tabulated values of air, at 315 Kelvin, which is going to be the average because we said it's H bar of between 298.15 and 328.15. We'll just say 315 Kelvin is good. And based on the tables that I found, we have the conductive coefficient of 27.41 times 10 to the negative 3. That's what that symbol means. We have the Prandtl number, which is a constant. We have the dynamic viscosity, which is 17.399 times 10 to the negative 6 power. And then we have thermal diffusion, which is 24.72 times 10 to the negative 6. We have thermal expansion, which is 0 0.0033 to the unit of below Kelvin 
Kelvin is in the denominator. That's what that's why it's got a negative one in the exponent. And then we have gravitational constant, which is 9.81 for sea level, which I am at. I am in Florida. And those are all of our knowns. So our first situation is we have our print bed, which it has no insulation currently. And we need to first find the average convective coefficient for air. The convective coefficient on average for air would be based on the Nusselt number of laminar flow averaged multiplied by the conductive coefficient of air divided by L, which is going to be our smallest dimension that we discussed. That is broken up even further for the Nusselt number of laminar flow on average by 0.52 times the Rayleigh number for air to the power of the fifth root. And then I've just simply moved the L dimension over here. And then again, I've moved the L in this step up again, and I gave it that negative exponent, so don't be confused. That is just this. But the Rayleigh number becomes this ugly thing right here, where it also involves an L. So if you do a little bit of algebra, you know that you can pull this L out of this fifth root power as long as you multiply the 3 to the 1 fifth, and then you have L to the 3 fifths, but you also have a negative 1, which is an equivalent to negative 5 over 5. And that's where I'm getting this from. Now, all of these are knowns in here. And so this is just me filling in all the numbers. This is times 10 to the negative 12th, that uppercase subscript E. That's just a common calculator symbol I've adopted. So we get this. It simplifies further. We have the negative 2 fifths power. And we end up getting that the convective coefficient for air at 315 Kelvin is 1.7957 watts per meter squared Kelvin, which gives us a our negative 53.87 watts per meter squared. And that is our heat transfer for our bottom side of our plate, assuming that heat does not leave out to the left, to the right, or to the top. This is just Q1 double prime going down with air rising up. These lines here with the arrows, this is going to be your Bernard current. These Bernard currents typically have different shapes depending on the situations that they're in, but because the hot plate is above and gases rise, it gets a weird effect where cool air actually comes in from the bottom and is, as it's heated up is pushed out and away and around the plate. Now, the smaller this plate gets, the more heat transfer that you get because it becomes more efficient because this air can get around this barrier much faster. We end up getting that our actual heat loss, if we assume from just one side, is negative 4.24 watts, or that we are losing 4.24 watts. That's why that sign is there. If we do put insulation, well, we already have the convective coefficient, which is nice because it saves us time. We've got our insulator with conductive coefficient k, and we've got our thickness t that we get to decide. So these two are variables actually that we can control. Remember that uh, because this one actually has conduction, we have to include conductive coefficient side and the convective coefficient side, which breaks out to the temperature bed difference and the insulator difference on this face because we assume that TB is on this heater generated line right here with negligible thickness, and TI is on the opposite side of the insulator. For convection, we have the insulator temperature difference between, and we have the heat transfer from here to the ambient air. And so this will give us our gradient for that. And now rearranging these two equations, we can get it in this form here, where we have just the T ambient and the temperature of the bed that we're concerned about which is great because now T of the insulator is negated just from rearranging around. And so now you can notice that it just becomes a summation in the denominator, all in parentheses though, never forget that, of all the thermal conductive components. 
So anytime you add more material, you're going to have to add another one. And you just get, let's say, T uh, thickness 2 divided by K of 2, which would be like another insulator that you add. And that would be a composite. Looking up certain conductive values for, let's say, Teflon, cork, and uh, just for the fun of it, aluminum. And you can see the difference between 0.35 0.039, which is really good, and then 167, which is huge. And this explains why aluminum is used in cooling fins, because its conductivity for power is so high. We don't want this, really. We actually want to make this, we want the smaller number when we're trying to create insulators. So I just chose a T value for our second situation, and that's going to be 0.79 millimeters. And that's actually a roughly one thirty second of an inch. And that's a common size for a lot of laminates. Now for state two, we have the temperature difference divided by our total combined conductivity and convectivity, which for this state would be 0.559 for Teflon, which would actually give us a negative 53.65 watts per meter squared which is actually not much. Now, if we did aluminum, eh, it just basically equals Q1. It doesn't really do much at all, it, even more negligible than this. Now, for cork, we end up getting a denominator of 0 0.5771, which gives us about 4.0908 watts, which, if we put this in percentage of efficiency, we actually find that Teflon gives us only a 0.42% of energy saved, which is sad. And you'd think that it would be much more because you see Teflon used in, in cooking products, which you want to absorb and keep heat in as for as long as possible so you don't have to keep heating it up to stay at a constant temperature. And then you see cork, which is 3.5%. That's a really good amount saved. Relatively, I mean, to just a, a th one thirty-second of an inch, that's thin. I mean, to give you an example, one thirty-second of an inch, ah, that's close enough. It's that. I mean, that's minuscule. That's nothing. And that's kind of what we're looking for in a sense, because we don't want to add too much mass to our project anyway. That ends up creating more vibration and inertial forces that we don't want to have to deal with with our print bed. So. As we can see, aluminum is neg negligible. We don't want to use that as K, or conductivity goes to infinity. We have our thermal resistivity go to zero. What if we wanted only this much power lost in heat instead of this? What thickness would we need, let's say, for cork, because cork was the most efficient? Well, we can do all the math out by breaking it down, and we end up finding that, well, the negatives cancel, by the way which is nice, rearranging through using just basic algebra, we find that T is equal to 0 0.0054 meters, or 5.4 millimeters. Cork seems like the best, right? From my experience, it's very brittle and granular, and it ends up falling apart and getting everywhere. Well, if it's a good insulator, we don't want those granules actually going into the control board. So cork seems like a good choice, and it seems like the best choice, but our focus is going to be using uh, Teflon and cork so we can make sure that the cork doesn't fall into our electronics.